Her name's Becky, and you can thank her for being here and coming out to see us. Proverbs 18 this morning in the Word of God. Going through Proverbs, and there's, there's a couple different ways you can preach through Proverbs. Uh, you could take all of the different subjects, and you could group them all together by subject. And there's probably 50 or 100 different subjects. And you could say, all right, we're going to start with one subject, and then every, every week we're going to bounce around to all the different places in Proverbs that talk about that subject. And then you could preach through all those and exhaust those, and then you can move on to the next subject. So we could have done that, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But I've kind of elected to just preach through them in order because God did put them in there in the order that he wants. Uh, and so uh, we're just sort of going through them sequentially. And so what that means is uh, rather than bouncing around through Proverbs, we're going sequentially through Proverbs, but we are bouncing around uh, on different subjects. And so uh, we'll, we'll cover a subject in one uh, truth or principle that's given about a certain subject, and then we'll depart from that subject for a few months, and then it'll resurface. And we'll be back to, uh, to hitting on a topic that we've already touched on previously. And, and so now we're returning this morning to the topic of friendship, the topic of friendship. And we did see uh, some truths about friendship in chapter 17, where we saw in the word of God that, uh, that a friend loveth at all times. And some of the surrounding verses there in chapter 17 give us some other uh, characteristics of a true friend. And, and God is so practical in his word, and he gives us uh, help for just the practical side of life and being a friend. And so he supplied some truths to us in, in the last chapter uh, about being a true friend. And I'll just recount a few of those to kind of bring us up to speed a little bit here. One of those that we saw is that a friend knows when to leave off contention. And we saw in chapter 17 that if you don't know when to leave off contention, it's like when one lets water out, that when you let out irrigation, when you're irrigating farmland and or you've got a, a, a dam and a dam is removed and there's flooding, um, you can't, there's nothing you can do about it. You can stand in the middle of it. You can't hold it back. It's coming out. And when we, contention is that way, uh, and a good friend knows when to leave off contention. You know, if you sometimes know what that hot button is, you know what that topic is that sets your friend off and gets them upset, man, wisdom is to just stay away from it. And if you just poke and prod a little too far, out the waters comes out. <laughs> there's, there's no stopping it. And so a true friend, okay, I know what's going to really upset. Now, faithful are the wounds of a friend. There are times when they maybe need to hear something they don't want to hear, uh, but you also need to know when it's, this is not the time for contention. Uh, and then we're also told that a, that a friend loveth at all times. A friend is with you even at bad times. You know, it's easy to be a friend, to befriend somebody when all is well and all is good, but at all times means even the rough times. And true friendship at times is going to cost something of you. There's going to be times when it's not going to be convenient for you to befriend somebody who God wants you to befriend. But a true friend is there anyway. And, and befriends them anyway, even when it's maybe detrimental to yourself, not, not convenient for yourself. And then the last part of it that we looked at is where we're told that you lack understanding if you become surety in the presence of your, if you strike hands and become surety in the presence of your friend. Surety in the Bible is talking about a, a co-signer or being collateral for somebody or being the one who will pay off a loan that they default on. And so what you're doing when you, when you become surety for somebody what you're doing is vouching for them. And what we said about that with regard to friendship is that true friendship does not require that you lie for somebody. True friendship does not require that you vouch for somebody or trust somebody who has not earned trust. You can love a friend and be there for a friend without having to declare them responsible if they don't happen to be a responsible person. You know, only become surety for somebody if their character does merit it. That doesn't make you a lousy friend. In fact, if they expect that of you, then they're the bad friend. If they, if they put you in that spot, they're the one who's not a true friend. And so we talked about some of those things last time. Our next verse here sheds some additional light uh, on friendship. And let's stand as we read Proverbs 18, verse 24, just to give reverence to the word of God. We're just looking at one verse this morning. Actually, we ended up sort of skipping over verse 23. We may go back to verse 23 last week. I just got so excited about preaching on marriage last week and friendship this week. I didn't really realize there was one in between. So we may go back next week and touch on verse 23 or the week after because we got Dr. Stone. Uh, Proverbs 18, verse 24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Heavenly Father, uh, empower and enable your word. May we understand and grasp and apply 
Lord, may we live thy word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would keep any distractions out of our hearts and just be magnified this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our title this morning is The Tragedy of Friendlessness. The Tragedy of Friendlessness. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad when somebody gets to the place in life where they don't have a single friend? It's sad. It's a tragedy. It doesn't have to be. Uh, and so we'll go through the cause of friendlessness, the result, and also the solution uh, to, uh, to the tragedy of friendlessness. Number one, it's cause. We find it's cause here in Proverbs 18, where we're told a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. There are different ways that you could make friends. You could buy friends if you wanted to. If you said, you know what, here's how I'm going to have people in my life. I'm going to spend lavishly. And I'm just going to try to attract the people in life who would like to have a little extra luxury and would like to have a little bit more. You could try to buy your friends. You could do that. And the book of Proverbs addresses that in other places. There are people all over that will gladly take you up on that. There will be people who would be happy to say, oh, you've got a yacht? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to be your friend. Oh, you've got, you know, you've got butlers and maids and you've got uh, the finest meals and you've got all this uh, property, oh, all these jet skis and things. And yeah, I'll, I'd like to play with your toys and I'll, I'll put up with you if I, if I get to play on your, uh, with your toys and enjoy some of the luxury that you have. There's, there'll be people who will be glad to take you up on that, but they're not friends. They're users and they're exploiters but they're not friends. And there's a difference. And we have to understand that there is a difference. The, the man who tries to make friends that way, the man who resorts to spending and buying friends, that man is not befriending. He's not serving. He's not loving. He's bribing. All he's doing is bribing. And, and, and that's not the kind of friendship that is pleasing to the Lord. God says that is not the way to have friends the way to have friends is, is, don't you love how simple Proverbs is? It's not rocket science. It's not complicated. The way to have friends is to show yourself friendly. Show yourself friendly. You can't just expect people to naturally gravitate toward you through no effort whatsoever on your own part. And so if you don't have friends, it's because you, you haven't shown yourself friendly. And that means that it's preventable. That means it's unnecessary. It's needless. If you, have, uh, if you show yourself friendly, you'll have friends. If we're going to have friends, the bur there's some burdens that fall on us. That means that we're going to have to learn how to take an interest in people. It means that we're going to have to learn how to initiate relationships. It means that we're going to have to learn how to seek people out on purpose and deliberately. It means that we're going to have to be proactive. That, that is how we can have friends, to show ourselves friendly. Uh, in our sin nature, we don't like that. In our sin nature, our first instinct is, no, that's too, yeah, I shouldn't have to show the effort. They should have to show the effort to me. <laughs> why, why is it me that has to show the effort? Uh, we, when we get down on ourselves and we're prone to being discouraged, and, and at times in life we kind of look around and we say, man, I just feel kind of lonely. And I just, I kind of feel friendless and I, I, I'm not very popular and, and I'm, I'm unpopular. And, and it, we very easily want to blame that condition on everybody else. It's everybody else's fault that I'm friendless. It's everybody else's fault that I'm not popular. And what God, you know, it's their fault because they haven't reached out to me. <laughs> That's our selfishness. And God, in God's word here, he says, no, it's your fault that you haven't reached out to them. That's why. You need to start reaching out to people and not just expecting that they'll reach out to you. We think we should get the easy part. We think we shouldn't have to exert the effort everybody else should. You know, sometimes it's tough to muster up the courage to approach somebody. And that's why we think, well, they, they should have to have to muster the courage to approach me. I shouldn't have to have to muster the courage to approach them. And we just kind of think that that's how it works. But that's not exactly how things work here, uh, according to the word of God. Um, you remember how in school, remember there was the in crowd? How many of you were part of the in crowd? <laughs> Not many. <laughs> we're, we're a peculiar people, right? We weren't, we weren't part of the in crowd. Uh, and there was many reasons why people got to be included in that crowd. Uh, maybe they were attractive and good looking. And so that it just was easy for them and everyone wanted to be around them. Or maybe they had the right last name. You remember pretty much no matter what school you went to, the, that certain family had the status in town. And if you were part of that family, you were 
one of the popular kids, or they had money, and so they were buying their friends, or they were very good at sports or, or extra talented, or maybe they became in the in crowd because they were the class clown and they were kind of the rebel and, and, and the other rebels appreciated that, that you know, and, and they kind of all got together. And, and so that's how they become uh, that elite crowd or the in crowd. And often what happens is many of the other kids who aren't, don't get to be privileged to be part of that crowd wish that they were. And they start to develop contempt for that crowd, not because of the immorality or not because of the superficiality. The contempt lies only in the, the envy and the desire to be one of them. And so they begin to lament uh, their, their lack of standing in that crowd. And, and, and when you begin to lament, you kind of start to stew on things. and You, you become a little bit resentful. And often the, the, the group that didn't get to be among that top group will kind of say, well, they've got some nerve. You know, they, I mean, what am I? I'm not cool enough for them. I'm not good enough for them. And they, they don't even know my name. And I'm, I'm just invisible. And, no, and they won't even talk to me. And they won't even say hello to me. And you, I kind of want to say to them, have you ever said hello to them? Have you ever said hi to them? Have you ever, have you ever shown yourself friendly to them? Well, I, but if I did, they'd just make fun of me. How do you know that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe they would. But then you'll at least have tried. You'll, you'll at least have done your part. And if they don't, at least you'll have, you'll have done that. And, and the only reason I bring that up is because that scenario plays out. The adult version of that scenario plays out all over society. That plays out uh, on the streets, in your neighborhood. It plays out in your workplace, even in churches. That scenario plays out. Uh, and we've got to guard that so that we know we have done our part and so that we don't become the, the ones with contempt and the ones who have some resentment and the ones that are kind of stewing because we don't feel accepted. There are churches that there's this kind of clickishness about them. And I've heard churches even in our area kind of bash, well, it's, it's real clicky over there and they didn't really let me in. Well, if the church doesn't have a friendly spirit, then they need to listen to God. They need to fix that. However, sometimes it may appear clickish in a church, but it may be because you went there two or three times and there's a bunch of people talking who are all served together in a ministry and they're talking about what they need to do to reach people for Christ. And there's some other people over here talking about uh, something that they're doing for the Lord. And it's, it's not that they just haven't reached out to me. Maybe they just need you to reach out to them. And so before we really uh, get on clickishness, maybe there's a reason for that. And, and so we just need to, to take that part on ourselves. The law of sowing and reaping is in effect with friendship. The law of sowing and reaping. You know, you, we can't complain that I can't say nobody cares about me and nobody will listen to me if I'm not willing to care for somebody else and listen to somebody else. They're sowing and reaping. If I'm willing to be friend and I'm willing to listen, and I'm willing to show care for somebody, more than likely there's going to be somebody who will return those things to me and somebody who will reciprocate that with me. But if I just expect that they're going to all, they all need to line up and be there for me without me doing that for them, then, then I've been unfair. I'm now expecting them to do something for me that I'm not willing to do for them. How's that fair? That's not just, that's not fair. And, and in our selfish sin nature, that's what we expect. That's how we, we expect things to operate. And we've got to change our thinking about that. Some, some will get mad at God. Some will get to a place in life where they're, they're discouraged and they're down and they feel lonely and they feel like nobody cares about them and they'll blame God. And they'll say, God, you didn't send me any friends. And God says in his word here, it's not that I haven't been good to you, it's that you haven't been good to others. Why don't you go doing some good and you know what's going to happen? You are going to reap what you've sown because there's a law of sowing and reaping that we find throughout God's word. Maybe if we feel like people aren't being all that good to us, maybe that's a reminder from the Holy Spirit of God through his word, go do some good. Be not weary in well-doing. We are saved unto good works. That's God's plan for the saved man. Go do good. And good's going to, sooner or later, good's going to come back to you. Do some sowing, do some sowing, and, and you'll reap sooner or later. The Bible, one of the things I love about the word of God is that it works together so well. And often you've got to obey and embrace and, and apply one scripture before you can really embrace and obey and apply another scripture. And here, uh, back in chapter 13 of Proverbs, we were told, uh, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. And here we're told that a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Your countenance 
is what you show. And if you're going to show yourself friendly, you're going to have to have a cheerful countenance. And too often, we don't. Too often, our, our countenance is not very cheerful. And an uncheerful countenance makes for an unfriendly person. And we're not showing ourselves friendly when our countenance isn't cheerful. And, and the Bible says our countenance is not cheerful because there's some, our heart is missing merriment. Well, a, 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 an uncheerful countenance is produced by an unmerry heart. And an unmerry heart is produced by, by uh, not having the joy of the Lord. And so we've got to have the joy of the Lord. Let my joy remain in you that your joy might be filled. And we've got to understand that that applies to us. It's a sin for saved people to not show themselves friendly. It's a sin. It's a sin. It's a wicked sin. If you know Christ as your Savior and, and you, you don't show yourself friendly, you're sinning, and so am I. And we, we, we say that with no uncertain terms. Now, the other side of that is that, oh, okay, so anybody who is friendly and cheerful, that's just proof automatically that they have the joy of the Lord, right? No, it doesn't work that way either because there are plenty of lost unregenerate, wicked, ungodly people who still smile a lot and laugh a lot and, and have a good time and have a bubbly personality and yet are involved in some of the most unbiblical, wicked things. And so it isn't, it isn't that, that cheerfulness and friendliness automatically means you have the joy of the Lord. But man, if you've got Christ in you, the hope of glory, praise God, that's all the reason to have a merry heart and that's all the reason to have a cheerful countenance. It's all the reason to be friendly. There's no reason to have the living Savior inside of you. There's no reason to have your home reserved forever in heaven and still walk around like a grump and still walk around snapping and walk around avoiding people and not being friendly. There's no reason for that. We had, uh, several years ago, we had a man walk into church and there was another man here in church who recognized the fellow that walked in. And the fellow that walked in didn't recognize the man that recognized him. And the one that recognized him said, later on, I talked to him and he said, yeah, I actually know that guy from years earlier, from where our paths had crossed and, and through work and things. And, and I'll tell you what, he said, you could have fooled me that that guy's a churchgoer. <laughs> he said, he's the last person that I would have thought was in church and, and, and knows the Lord and is saved. He said, I never would have guessed it because the guy was always sour. And the guy was always just snappy and grumpy and cranky. And I never would have guessed that that we'd be in the same church, opening the same Bible, and listening to the same, same preacher. I never would have guessed it. Man, we ought to determine that that will never be said of us the moment we walk into a church door. We've got to determine that that will never be said of us. If we learn to be friendlier, would we not see a lot more people come to Christ? Would our witness not be so much more effective if we learn to be friendlier? You, you can be friendly and not be fruitful, but you cannot be fruitful and not be friendly. If you're not friendly, you'll never be fruitful. You just won't. Now, but you may say, that's hard for me. And I understand that. You know, it's harder for some than others. It is. And there, God made personalities different, and we all have our quirks, and, and we're not all carbon copies. And I praise God for the variety of his creation and his design, and that's what makes it fun because we're all quirky and oddball and different. But some may say, well, I'm, just, I'm not extroverted, and I'm not very confident, and I'm not very chatty. And I understand it. It is harder for you. And, but just because it's hard for you does not mean you're exempt from it. Every Bible-believing, born-again child of God is told at Proverbs 18, 24. You've got to show yourself friendly, even if it's hard. And the harder it is, the more you need God to do it for you. And, and that might be the thing that's hard for you. And you might look at some of the others in the church. Man, it's just so easy for them. They've got the gift of gab, and they're just so gregarious. Yeah, but there's other things that are hard on them that are easy for you. And, and they need God to... Enable them to do what's harder for them. And so the things that we struggle with are reminders, got to let God take over. Got to ask God to perform this for me. So that's number one, the cause. Number two, it's result. The tragedy of friendlessness. Number two, it's result. We find here in verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Maybe you've been extremely fortunate in life and you've been very blessed in life and you've been given one of those friends in your life that is even closer to you than your own siblings. And, and that's a blessing from God. That's a great gift from God to have a friend who's even closer to you than your own siblings. That's not a word against siblings. You can have a great relationship with your siblings and it's not that your sibling has done anything wrong and it's not that your relationship is lacking or broken. 
But there's a friend who, who God has placed into your life who is just has stuck to you even closer than your sibling has. And, and that happens. That's a, a statement as to the value of that friend, not a statement as to the problem with that sibling. But you won't find the one who sticks that close if you don't have any who could potentially become that close. There are varying levels of friendship. You know, we, when you start showing yourself friendly, you start making acquaintances, you start making contacts, you start having relationships, but they begin distant. Most relationships don't begin sticking closer than even a sibling. They begin somewhat distant, and that's how you create a pool of people who could become the one who sticks closer to you than a sibling. And so you show yourself friendly, you make contacts, you make friends, and now you've got a whole group of them who are kind of at a distance. And then as time goes on, there's sort of a process of elimination that some kind of go away, but a few remain in your life over time. And of the few that remain in your life over time, there may be just one. It's singular in this verse, isn't it? There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And, and so, so you're not going to have the one that sticks close if you don't have the pool to choose from. If you don't have the pool who could, and you're not going to have the pool who could if you don't show yourself friendly. And so we see how important it is to show yourself friendly, to give the, this pool of potentials who could be the one who's there for you when you just need somebody to stick by you. It's very important that we have that, we give ourselves that opportunity to have that one who's there for us because closeness, sticketh closer. The word closer is used. We need closeness. We've got to have closeness. God said it's not good for the man to be alone. We've got to have closeness in our lives. How many people say they're Bible believers, say they love the Lord, but they've got no use for church because they can't stand people? Well, yeah, they're sinners, but so are you. <laughs> and, and you need people. You need the church. You're, it's not good for you to be alone. You've got to be assembled with the brethren. You've just got to have that because the more alone we are, the, the, lit, the, the, the less closeness we have in our lives. When we miss closeness, we're going to be prone to despair. We're going to be prone to resentment. That's what lack of closeness does. You've got to have people close to you. We need that. God says that we need that. But even if we don't have someone who is that one friend that sticks closer than a brother to us, that doesn't mean we can't say, I, I still, even though I've got nobody that close to me, I still can be that for somebody else. Not that I'm competing with their sibling, not that I'm trying to wedge in and, and drive them away from their sibling so I can have that top spot, but I can be willing to be that close friend to somebody who needs that close friend. One of the things I love about this church, one of the things I love about you people, <laughs> you, you friends, is that, Man, I'm not preaching this thinking that this is something our church struggles with at all. This is such, there's people here, I'm going to tell you, if I, if I were no longer your pastor, if I messed up, if I did, went off the deep end, if I did something silly, if I, if I disqualified myself from being eligible to be your pastor, I know for sure that this room is filled with people who would still be my friend and would still love me. I praise, I praise God for you being a church like that. If some of you, if I were, I could think of 20 people, 30 people, I could call up and say, I know I've lost your respect. I know I've disappointed you. I just need a friend right now. Can we just get together? Can we just talk because I need a friend? I know for a fact there would be people in here that, that would say, yeah, absolutely, I'll be there. I'm glad to help you. Let, let's keep being, God is blessing that spirit here. God is blessing that the bonds that were almost 11 years, they're getting stronger. Church, can you, can you feel that? Can you sense that, that the, the togetherness that we have, it's growing. And our loyalty to one another, our willingness to, to be there for one another and to stick close, it really is growing. It's great to see. It really is. And, and you are that way because you know that pleases God. And that's the right reason to be that way. You think about the, maybe the best example, I'm sure the first example that would jump to your mind as a, as a Bible reader, as a, as, a, as a Bible enthusiast, is David and Jonathan. Probably the first example that we think of as a great friendship in the Bible, a friend that sticks closer than a brother, Jonathan was far closer to David than any of David's brothers. In fact, David's brothers were a bunch of skunks anyway. Jonathan was just what David needed because his brothers didn't treat him very well. And so Jonathan became this great example of, of a true friend in the Bible who stuck even closer to David than David's own brothers did. And Jonathan, man, he was willing to, he was the heir. He was Saul's son. He, he should have been the next king had not God taken the kingdom from Saul. And so many, how many would have been bitter against the one who was going to get it anyway? But David loved, or Jonathan loved him anyway, even though that was the one that was going to take the spot that he could have had. Man, so many of us would have been just troubled by that and could not have spoken peaceably unto David. 
But Jonathan just recognized it was the doings of God, and he wanted to please God. And, and Jonathan was to David just what David needed him to be. And when David was distressed and discouraged, who was it that strengthened his hand in God? It was Jonathan. God help us to be the friend that strengthens somebody's hand in God when they're distressed and discouraged. You can be that for somebody if we'll let God work in us. Jonathan continually put himself at risk for David's sake. Man, I appreciate Jonathan in the Bible. What a great care. He stuck close. Man, if you have a friend like that, if, you, if, you ha if you're the David and you have a Jonathan, you're blessed, praise God. But if you could be a friend like that, that is honorable. It's a blessing to have a friend like that. It is honorable to be the friend like that. that that's going to be fulfilling. That's going to be uh, what, what fulfills, uh, fulfills our hearts. And so that's its cause, its result. Lastly, its solution. Its solution. The tragedy of friendlessness. Number three, its solution. For this, we're going to turn over to John chapter 15. The solution to friendlessness. You just couldn't possibly talk about Proverbs 18.24 without turning to John 15. It's almost like, like God gave Solomon Proverbs 18.24 knowing full well that a couple thousand years later, he was going to give these words that we find here in John chapter 15, verses 13 to 15, because they just, they just have to be understood together. They, they, the, what we find here in John 15 is the purest and truest and fullest fulfillment of that, of that one friend who sticketh closer than a brother. John 15 and verse 13, the Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. And even if you don't have another friend in this world, you can have a friendship with the creator of this world who died on the cross and took, took the sin of every man, tasted death for every man and had power to lay his life down for his friends, but he's the only one who had power to take it again forever to secure everlasting life and to offer it to you if you'll come to him and admit that you need everlasting life. If you'll, if you'll ask him to save your soul forever, you can have a friend, you gotta, but you gotta be born again. You've gotta be born again. Uh, you've gotta know him. You've got to know him personally. And there are many who have called on his name, but he says, there's going to be some that have, have, have done all these things in my name, but I'm going to say unto them, depart from me, I never knew you. Ye that work iniquity. Depart from me, I didn't know you. I didn't know you personally because you're not born again. You've never consciously asked me to save your soul for all eternity, forever. And that's how you can have this faithful friend be called a friend of Jesus Christ. You've got to be born again. The, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Those that are not regenerated, those that have never, they're trusting in other things and they're adding to the gospel and they're believing a false gospel. He doesn't know them. But he does know them that are his. Second Timothy chapter two says, he, he, the Lord knoweth them that are his. He was wounded in the house of his friends, betrayed by one. Uh, what does the Psalm say about Judas? In Psalm 41, mine own familiar friend the, who did eat of my bread. He's betrayed in the house of his friends. His own familiar friend betrayed him, and yet he had the grace and love to lay down his life for his friends. Even for the ones who betrayed him, it was offered. For every sinner, where sin hath abounded, grace hath much more abounded. The friendship with the Lord. God didn't have to offer his creatures friendship, but he did. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You know, it was rare in the Old Testament. Abraham was called the friend of God. Uh, Moses, we're told, the Lord spake unto Moses as a friend, as a, as a, as a man speaketh unto his friend, but that was rare. They're the only ones that carried that distinction. But in the New Testament era, we find that everyone who comes to Jesus Christ receives the most faithful friend that they will ever have. A friend who truly sticketh closer than a brother. And the interesting part is that Hebrews 2 says he's our brother too. <laughs> he's our master, he's our Lord, he's our friend, he's our brother but he'll never leave us nor forsake us. That's, that's close sticking right there. Never, ever leave us, never, ever forsake us. But you can only have that friendship with Christ. If, it, if you come unto him and it's about him alone, 
for your salvation from your sins. You, that friendship isn't offered if it's Christ plus baptism. That friendship isn't offered if it's Christ plus sacraments. That friendship isn't offered if it's Christ plus what some priest can do for you. It's not offered if it's Christ plus speaking in tongues or some, or some weird demonstration of some kind of oddball thing. It's got to be Christ alone. Jesus by himself purged our sins. That's the only way to have that friend is to get everything else out. Lord Jesus, it is all about you. I need you to save my soul and he'll save you directly. Not through a church, not through a sacrament, not through a priest, not through a baptism. It, there's one mediator between men and God, the man Christ Jesus. He is the advocate, Christ alone. Friendship with him enables us to show ourselves friendly. And he paid my price. He. I could never in a million years pay my price. And he paid it for me for free. He gave me his righteousness, the most valuable, precious commodity uh, in all of the world and all of eternity. He gave it to me for free. Man, it's the very least I could do to smile and be cheerful and be friendly. Why in the world would I want to walk around frowning and scowling and avoiding people? When, I, when I'm saved forever, my price is paid. I'm going to heaven, no doubt about it. Sometimes we're unfriendly because we've still got hurts. Yeah, you're saved. Praise God. He bought you. But you've got your hurts and you've got your sorrows and you've got your disappointments. And sometimes the hurts and the sorrows and the disappointments cause us to kind of not really feel like being all that friendly to anybody right now. And that, that happens that we just don't feel like being friendly. But man, if you've got the one in you who's risen from the grave, he's the risen one. He'll rise above the sorrows. He'll rise above the hurts. He'll rise above the disappointments and he'll, he'll produce friendliness in you. If you let him, he longs and desires to produce friendliness in you, to produce fruitfulness in you. We just need to let him. We just need to get ourselves out of the way. I must decrease and he must increase. Just because he has graciously called us his friends, however, doesn't mean that we can treat him like a buddy and a pal. It doesn't mean that we can be flippant with him. It's still, I still love our church name, Majesty Baptist, because honor and majesty are still before him. And so, it's, well, I'm praise the Lord. He, he loved me enough to call me a friend, not just a servant, but that doesn't mean I'm not a servant. That doesn't mean he's just my buddy and my, my, uh, my coworker and just my pal. Uh, we, can't, we can't bring him down to our level. Because look at verse 14. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. So the friend relationship doesn't cancel out or undo the master-servant relationship. Our relationship with our Lord and Savior is very multifaceted. He, he describes it a number of different ways. He's still our Lord and still our master, and he's also our friend. One doesn't come at the expense of the other. One doesn't kick the others out. And so really what he's getting at is verse 15, where he's saying that it's about his openness and his transparency. Look at, for, look at John 15, 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. What he's getting at with regard to, to comparing his relationship with us to a friendship is he's saying, I've been open with you. I've been transparent with you. I haven't hid anything from you. I've been with the Father pre-eternally and everything I'm telling you, I'm not concealing the things that, that are true. I haven't held anything back. And he uses a comparison to a workplace. You know, you, we've all had bosses who, because of the re work relationship, it's a professional relationship. And I've had some bosses that have been friends, but I've had bosses that it's been strictly a professional relationship. And, and that kind of relationship, the boss has really no inclination to disclose intimate details of who he is or who, or who, her, who she is with her inferiors and with her employees or with his employees, but a friend does. A friend does disclose to you what's really going on in their life, and a friend doesn't hold back, and a friend does confide in you, and a friend is willing to disclose the, some of the truth about them because you're in a friend relationship, and that's what the Lord is saying. He says, I've hid nothing from you. I, I have not uh, spoken to you in secret, he said elsewhere. I've gotten it all out there. I've told you exactly who I am. I've told you exactly where I'm from. I've told you exactly what my will is for you. I've told you exactly where I'm going. I've told you exactly what I want. I've told you exactly what I want to do in you. I've held nothing back from you. So the question then is, why are we holding back from him? He holds nothing back from us. Why are we holding anything back from him? He laid down his life for us, sticks close to us, 
And no man hath greater love than that. We, talk, we quote that verse all the time when we have special military days and we honor soldiers. Man, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And it's, it's true in theology. It's true with winning our salvation that it, the greatest expression of love that our Savior had for us is that I'm willing to die for you. And we, can, uh, we apply that to the soldiers. They, what, what friendship with our fellow countrymen that they are willing to, to die for us to protect our rights and freedoms. But, man, what a – think about 9-11. And man, you know, every 9-11 you can preach against Islam. That's a pretty easy sermon. Just every once a year we preach against Islam on 9-11, you know. But, but think about the difference between false religion and biblical Christianity. Uh, Islam says, if you lay down, the God of Islam, Allah, says, if you lay down your life for me and you take out as many people as you can, innocent people on the way out, you might have a slightly better chance of getting to heaven and enjoying your carnal virgins in heaven. The God of Christianity, the God of the Bible says, I've already died for you. It's not that you have to die for me. It's that I've already died for you to ensure that you can go to heaven, to guarantee that you'll be in heaven with certainty, no doubt about it. What a stark difference that is. It's entirely different belief system. But once we have received him, there is still some dying that we've got to do. We do still have to die to self. We do still have to die to sin. And we are told to give our lives as a living sacrifice. Not a dead one, a living one. And part of being a living sacrifice is being friendly, showing ourselves friendly. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Let's work at that. I know, I know that's a strength of our church, but we can develop that and we can, we can be more of what we ought to be for him and watch him use it. Watch him bless it. Watch him reward it. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I thank you so much for your attention this morning. I love speaking to a church that's hungry for the word and is excited about what God is saying to us, excited to to take on the challenge of living out God's word and applying all that it says. I would ask you this morning with no eye, nobody looking around, nobody embarrassing you, nobody singling you out, eyes closed, is there anyone who would say, I don't yet know him personally as my savior? For me, it's always been Christ plus something else, or I've always gotten it confused with putting something else in between. It's never been just between me and the Lord directly, but I would like to get that settled once and for all forever so I never have to worry about that again. Is there anyone like that here this morning? Would you show me by an uplifted hand if that's, that's something that's been on your heart? There's no hands up, but, but let me encourage you. If that is the case with you and you just didn't put your hand up, come and find me. Come and find Brother John. Come and find my wife. Uh, come and find uh, others and, and ask them, how, I would like to get this settled. Can you just help me to get this settled? There's people here that would love to help you with that. I would also ask you as we, in a moment, have a time of invitation. Brother John is going to lead us in a, in a brief hymn. And, and Miss Valerie's going to play, and we'll stand in a moment. But just to give you some, some things to respond to the Lord about, you might say, man, I, God has, has taught me this morning, I need to be better about reaching out. I, may, I maybe need to, to repent of blaming some disappointments on others. I, I need to make a point to be more proactive in seeking people out. And maybe I need to quit making excuses that it's been their fault. I need to recognize this morning it's been my fault. Maybe I just need to have a better attitude. I just need to make a point to have more, more cheerfulness about me and just to be a little bit friendlier. And, and I'm committing a fresh and a new this morning, just being better about that. As the others 